morning, everyone. As uh, Chris was saying, I'm Päivi from Tampere University. Uh, this is basically a replay of a talk I gave at the ETRA conference. So I'm sorry if one of you was there and heard it, but perhaps you learned something more out of it anyway and can invent some nice questions for me. Yeah, but today I will talk about the potential of gaze for human augmentation. To set the context for my talk, I will first briefly tell about my background. So I come from Tauki, the Tampere unit for computer human interaction, established by Professor Kariogo Raiha. Tauki has conducted eye tracking uh, related research since 1990s. We have especially focused on the applied use of eye tracking from the analysis of interfaces to case based human computer interaction. I'm also involved in the work of the Cocaine Association. Cocaine promotes research and development in the field of gaze-based interaction with special focus on communication by interaction, uh, gaze interaction for people with disabilities. Here, uh, gaze interaction is used to compensate for impaired abilities. Gaze empowers people by giving voice to those who cannot speak and means to control to those who cannot move. Even if you are otherwise totally paralyzed, you can enter text by gaze, play games, browse the internet, control a wheelchair, and much more. There are insights and lessons learned from using gaze in assistive technology that can be applied in human augmentation also in other contexts. Eyeglass is one realized human vision by offering an easy, non-invasive way to compensate for deficiencies in vision. Instead of using a magnifying glass as a tool to see better, the person can simply wear the glasses and concentrate on viewing. Similarly, multimodal wearable technology may act as a facilitator to non-invasively augment human abilities seamlessly, as if the enhancement were part of the natural human abilities. In this picture, I'm trying out an eye tracker that is embedded in the frames of the eyeglasses. These kinds of developments open new opportunities for exploiting gaze input in wearable interfaces. Human augmentation is an interdisciplinary field that addresses methods, technologies, and their applications for augmenting human abilities. Historical methods of augmentation by chemical substances or implants were invasive. Current multimodal wearable sensing and actuation technologies offer a non-invasive way to augment human senses, human action, and human cognition. As discussed earlier, technology can empower people with disabilities. Technology can take us further by augmenting human abilities beyond their natural limits. For example, hearing augmentation may not only mitigate hearing loss, but could also catalyze super hearing or augment the real sound environment with extra information. In this talk, I will focus especially on the role of gaze in human augmentation. In many scenarios, gaze plays a crucial role due to its unique cap capability to convey the focus of interest. Let's consider some examples. Gaze indicates where our visual attention is. This means the system not only knows what we have looked at, but also which parts of the scene we have not seen. This makes it possible to guide you to look at the relevant parts or perhaps filter out irrelevant information to help focusing on the task. When I was a child, I felt like my mom had eyes in her back augmented vision could actually give me those. Gaze conveys the target of interest. Life locking is used to enhance memory. Information from, from gaze helps to save and mark for later recall those parts that really matter. Pointing by gaze is natural. Gaze direction uh, intuitively sets the target for various actions. 
if you are wearing a selective microphone, case direction can help to pinpoint the target for enhanced hearing. Case anticipates action. We look at things before acting on them. This is important for setting the target for augmented actions, for example, for remote operation by speech or hand gestures. It also enables proactive actions where case information is used to assist us even before we explicitly ask for it. Case behavior helps interpreting the user's state. For example, if the user is confused, cognitive augmentation may provide explanations automatically without the user needing to stop the action to consult ex external information sources. These were just some examples. There are many more, for example, related to exploiting gaze as social tool to enhance remote collaborations like we have now, et cetera, et cetera. Considering gaze interaction, the emphasis has been on augmenting the capabilities of people with different types and levels of disabilities. The aim has been to enable them to participate in the information society on the same terms as anybody. On the other hand, previous work on attentive systems has been important to explore how, how to exploit the opportunities that gaze-based augmentation offers for mainstream applications. There are insights and lessons learned from previous research on gaze interaction that could be applied in human augmentation. In this talk, I will give a brief summary of the application areas, different types of eye movements, as well as select examples of how to cope with the challenges involved in using gaze uh, and eye movements in interactive uh, applications. By these examples, I hope to highlight some key design issues. For example, I hope to give ideas how eye tracking could be applied in human augmentation on various levels, from being a passive information source to active control. In addition to gaze pointing mentioned earlier, also other types of eye movements can be useful. Each have their benefits and challenges, and the best choice depends on the application and task. There are challenges involved in uh, when a perceptual organ is used for interaction. Feedback is part of the solution. We will look at this as well as other challenges and example solutions derived from previous work on the area. After looking at this, I will discuss some future views and propose a call for research for human augmentation. Let's start uh, with a quick glance at the application areas, types of eye movements and challenges involved in using gaze in HGI. Eye tracking can be applied in interaction on various levels. This figure shows a continuum of eye tracking applications. At one end of the continuum, offline recordings of unintentional natural eye movements are used passively for diagnostic applications. For example, eye tracking is a valuable tool for evaluating user interfaces. In the other end, eye tracking is used for explicit eye input Case is intentionally used for communication and control, which is useful for people with severe disabilities, especially, but can be used for anybody. In between, there are categories with increasingly active application of case. The information gathered from natural uh, case behavior can be used for understanding and modeling user behavior. This information can then be used, for example, for activity recognition, which I believe to be directly relevant for some of the human augmentation scenarios presented earlier. The next step is to exploit the information in real time to inform, infer user intent and predict user behavior. Such gaze-aware, attentive applications change their behavior based on the user's natural gaze behavior and can react more naturally at the right time. For human augmentation, this could mean the system supports human actions without needing uh, extra information to give an explicit con command, while the user still feels being in control and can focus on the task at hand. 
it should be noted that the boundaries of the categories are not clear cut. For example, people may learn to take advantage of the proactive features of an eye aware system and start to use them intentionally to enhance the eye tracking features of the application. Sorry. I can't resist sharing this figure from history. Even if yes based human computer interaction is still fairly rare in everyday applications, it has been used in assistive technology for decades. One of the earliest systems, the eye letter selector, could detect rough eye movements from left to right. Column row scanning was used to move from one letter to another. The currently highlighted letter was selected by an eye gesture to the right. Here, the eyes were used as simple switches. All of the basic types of eye movement, such as fixations, saccades, and smooth pores, so it can be exploited and gains interaction. Prolonged fixation on a target, referred to as dwell time, is the most used method for making selections by gaze alone. Differentiation from visual inspection is made based on the duration of the dwell time. The threshold depends on the task and the user. In any case, the duration should uh, exceed the normal viewing time for the current object in the current context. Gaze gestures are eye movements that follow a defined pattern interpreted as a command. The gesture can be simple, even one stroke, or it can be complex, including several strokes, which can be translated into an extensive set of commands. The gestures can be bound to certain locations, but they can also be relative based on the changes of the angle of the eye movement. Smooth pursuit occurs when we follow a smoothly moving target. For interaction, finding a correlation between the object movement and the user's eye movement can be used to select the desired object. Relative uh, gaze gestures, as well as smooth pursuit interactions can be implemented with electrooculography EOG based trackers, which is useful, especially in mobile settings. There are also other types of eye movements, such as voluntary virgins or plinks that have been uh, exploited for interaction, either alone or combined with other methods. A summary of these can be found in our book chapter on eye movements and human computer interaction. Eye tracking offers many benefits for human computer interaction. There are also challenges some technical and some more related to interaction. Camera-based eye tracking has challenges that are related to the fact that the tracker needs to have a clear view of the eye and the pupil to be able to track reliably. This makes eye tracking a serious business. Squeezing the eyes when laughing may prevent the camera from seeing the pupil. EOG-based tracker avoids these problems but it is not good for measuring uh, gaze direction. Inaccuracy uh, of the measured gaze position is one of the main challenges for interaction, limiting the size of the target that can be easily selected by gaze. Challenges for human computer interaction come partly from the characteristics of eye movements. The biggest challenges are related to the ambiguous interpretation. What does it mean that the user is looking at something? The Midas touch problem occurs when viewing viewed objects are selected without the user's intention. So everywhere you look, it gets selected. There are also challenges related to the user experience. For example, unnatural eye movements such as gaze gestures are not only awkward to make, but may also attract uh, unwanted attention and they look weird. All of these highly relevant, all of these are highly relevant when case interaction is applied for human augmentation, especially the inaccuracy 
ambiguous interpretation and neither stats can make the case interaction challenging. Next, I will present some example solutions and lessons learned from previous research on case on AGI and assistive technology. When thinking about case-based human computer interaction, perhaps the first idea that comes to the mind is mouse emulation, where a gaze is bound to the car cursor. If the user stays still and has good control of the eye movements, quite accurate control is possible. However, there are often situations where the available gaze tracking accuracy doesn't meet the needs of the user. There are ways to cope with the inaccuracy. The most obvious way is to use some sort of a magnifying class to increase the size of the target. This is usually included in software that comes with mouse emulation and assistive uh, uh, software. Invisible zooming may also be used, especially if there is no confusion between nearby targets. In practice, the case reactive area is defined to be larger than the object, allowing good perceived accuracy. There are also other methods that could be considered for example, semantic zooming or probabilities. These depend on the task and require context knowledge of the underlying application. Even if a manual control uh, is available, case awareness may still uh, improve the interaction as demonstrated with magic pointing by Chai et al. already long time ago. Magic pointing combined the best of both. Fast eye movements was used to automatically move the mouse cursor close to the target the user looked at so that the fine grain movement by hand could then be used to place it accurately to the target. Here, manual operation was augmented by gaze. This work and the fact that we have seen some users trying to fix the calibration errors by leaning their heads towards the target motivated us to conduct a series of experiments where we combined gaze pointing with possibility of doing the fine movements with head. Results showed that head assisted eye pointing significantly improves the pointing accuracy without a negative impact on the pointing time. The figure shows the difference between the head movement enabled or turned off. In some cases, participants were able to point almost three times closer to the target center compared to the eye pointing alone. The effect was bigger in the corners of the screen where the accuracy is worse than in the center of the screen. This demonstrates that head assisted eye pointing is a comfortable and potentially very efficient alternative to other methods such as zooming. In many scenarios, knowing the actual case position is not needed. Simply detecting the presence of the eyes can be useful. There is no need to know the accurate case position. In this picture, two concepts are presented tracking included in the classes or camera in the watch. With eye awareness, the smartwatch knows the notification was seen. Simple sideways gesture uh, can be used to activate the watch or navigate the screens. This was a simple feasibility study, not yet considering ergonomic issues. In practice, the visibility to the eyes can be an issue. One of the eye movement types presented earlier was smooth pursuit. Pioneering work on that has been done by Vidal et al. As the mapping is based on the object moving pattern and speed, location information nor calibration is uh, needed. Thus, uh, accuracy is not an issue. We tested two different pursuit movements to control the widget by gaze. 
moving objects were shown on top of the widgets. Following their movement on either direction either decreased or increased the continuous value set by the widgets. Following the movement on the rotary control was equally efficient as the dwell time. It was also considered more comfortable than the sc scroll bar where following the moving object on the widget caused jump errors when the uh, user moved from end to end. This kind of widgets could be useful, for example, for adjusting volume or light levels remotely. During a pandemic, like the coronavirus situation we have now, such contactless operation might be appreciated. As demonstrated by Esteves et al., uh, smooth persoid-based orbits can be overlapping and they can be quite small, making possible to uh, utilize them even in small interfaces, such as smart swatches. In the previous examples, this interaction was based on uh, recognizable patterns of gaze gestures or matching the movement patterns of the object and smooth pursuit eye movement. As learned earlier, pointing by gaze is fast and easy. If the simple act of looking is used for selection, this poses the Midas touch problem. All objects looked at are selected. Combining gaze pointing with other selection methods is an obvious solution for the Midas touch problem. For example, the selection can be made by manual switches, blinking, or some other uh, bodily action. Virtual uh, menus or buttons may also have special selection areas that can be used to separate looking from selection. Considering human augmentation, combining gaze pointing with simple head gestures offers an easy and natural interaction method. A major advantage of this is that the user keeps the gaze on the object of interest while interacting. Participants found nodding as the best gesture for occasional selection tasks. Turning left or right were considered potentially useful for navigation tasks and tilting for functional mode changing. Nodding had the best detection rate, but the tracker lost the gaze sometimes when doing uh, the other gestures. The gaze estimation accuracy did not noticeably uh, suffer from quick head motions, surprisingly. In this study, we detected the gaze gestures from the eye tracking data from the remote tracker uh, using a range-based algorithm. The head gestures can also be recognized from a head-mounted tracker as demonstrated by Amanda Beggy and colleagues. What if the separate method to make the selection is not available nor, nor viable? As mentioned earlier, uh, when discussing different eye moments, prolonged fixation can be used to dwell on the object for long enough for it to, to be selected. Dwelling is an easy and commonly used method for making selections by gaze. However, it is fundamentally different from making a manual selection. Using a button click, you make the selection. You define the exact moment for the action. And when clicking, you feel the button and perhaps hear the click. Using 12 time, you initiate the action and the system makes the selection after a predefined dwell time. And your gaze is bound to the object. It needs to stay there until the selection is made. Furthermore, objects do not naturally react on being looked at. So any feedback must be provided by the system. When using gaze in interaction, proper feedback is essential. Is the tracker following my gaze in the first place? Does it recognize what I'm looking at? By the way, it should be noted that in many cases, indicating the focused item may be more relevant than showing the exact measured position of gaze, which may be a little bit off due to technical inaccuracy problems. Or how long do I need to dwell? And was the intended item selected? 
without proper feedback and not knowing the status of the system, it is hard to feel being in control. Feedback is also essential for preventing errors. Visual feedback can be uh, given on the location of the action uh, with smart, smart classes. It is possible to augment the object with feedback that is not naturally available, perhaps even with hints on how the object can be interacted with. Auditory or haptic feedback provide some additional benefits. First, they, they are available even if there is nothing to look at and they are not bound to gaze location. Haptic feedback also provides a private, private way of giving feedback, as it is only felt by the uh, user wearing the device. User needs, context, and availability affect the select, selection of the suitable feedback mod modality. Now, Let's have a look at an example of gaze gesture interaction with haptic feedback. We experimented with off-screen gaze gestures for controlling a mobile phone. The task was to select a name from the contact list and make a simulated call. The list, list could be scrolled up and down by quick glances above or below the screen. A gesture to the right started the call and a gesture to the left cancelled the action. Vibrotactile feedback was given on the phone, felt by the user holding the phone. We compare, compare different options where the haptic feedback was, was either absent or given for the full gesture when returning back to the screen, or for the stroke out, or, or both. Giving haptic feedback increased efficiency of the interaction. Measured in completion times, the most efficient conditions were out and both that provided feedback when the gaze was outside of the display borders. Giving feedback while doing the gesture indicated the outgoing stroke was correctly recognized, keeping the user informed about the status of the system. Getting feedback in the end of the gesture conf confirmed the action even without visually inspecting the results on the screen, enabling fast browsing of several items. We also tested giving haptic feedback on the eyeglasses. The viper tactile feedback was felt on the frames of the, frames of the glasses. Again, giving haptic feedback improved the interaction. Giving feedback on the same uh, side where the gesture was done, supported spatial conclusions, which was appreciated by the users. Without going uh, into too much detail, I want to emphasize that there are many small details to be considered to ensure full success of the feedback. For example, remembering eye movements are quite fast one should keep in mind that there are limitations to the acceptable feedback delay, depending on the type of the eye movement. If the delay is too long, it is hard to associate the feedback with the action. Also, the duration of the feedback matters. Very short audible click is easy to perceive, while short visual feedback can be easily missed. Depending on the context and task, also the body location, amplitude, frequency of the feedback should be considered. All these little implementation issues can make it or break it, so they should be considered. To finish this section on a gaze in HEI and assistive technology, I would like to remind that you don't need to settle for just exploiting one type of eye movement. Sometimes it makes sense to combine them. The solution proposed in this video called Snap Clutch is incorporated in the mouse emulation software. It uses modes to enable different types of mouse behavior to be emulated with gaze and by using gestures to switch between these modes. 
this combination of gaze pointing, dwelling, and gestures enables a full play experience, including navigation, fighting, interacting with objects, and changing the settings in the game, all by gaze alone. Next, let's have a brief look at some lessons learned from gaze in attentive interfaces. The Midas touch is a problem for explicit gaze-based applications. Ambiguous interpretations is even bigger problem when natural eye movements are used for in attentive interfaces. Tackling this problem uh, should be interesting for human augmentation as information from natural viewing is relevant for many of the scenarios presented earlier. Again, this is not a new problem. As illustrated by the work by Jarpus over 50 years ago, the task or intent of the user changes the gaze behavior drastically. This poses the problem of implicit selection. What can be interpreted from gaze position? Perhaps the person is looking at something but not really perceiving it. The person may also be using an object even uh, if not visually attending it. Is, is it then intentionally, intentionally ignored? If a person is dwelling on an object, does that indicate engagement or confusion? Or like an example by Jarpus, is the scan pad task driven or is the person just randomly looking at the scene? This example on, on this slide is old, but still relevant as it helps me to highlight some key design issues. IDICT is a gaze aware aid for reading text in foreign language. It follows the natural reading process and tries to recognize when the reader might benefit from help. For example, when the reader spends more time than expected on a word or a phrase, automatic translation is provided. First, it shows the best guess of a translation about the position where the reader is stuck. If this gloss is not enough, the user can look at the dictionary frame next to the uh, text to get the full translation from dictionary. The dictionary entry is automatically vets from the dictionary and requires no other action from the user than just looking at the dictionary frame. The same problems that are present in explicit eye input interfaces are also found in attentive applications. Here, spatial inaccuracy made it a challenge to map the point of case to the right word. We developed an algorithm that uh, followed the reading and example uh, and for example, recognized uh, seeing the move from one row to another, just keeping in track of the row, even if the measured gaze position was vertically off. Sometimes, especially if the reader made jumps between the rows, the tracking went off. We showed a thin marker below the row that enabled the reader to adjust it manually with the arrow keys. Timing accuracy resembles dwelling. How long does the reader need to focus on or return to the word before the system interprets is as a good time to offer help? Here we exploited knowledge of typical reading base as well as information about the frequency of the words. It is not very likely that the reader would need help for a common word. Considering the linguistic accuracy improved the quality of the translations. For example, automatic translation took into account if the word is a noun or a verb, and it could also recognize simple phrases. If that was not helpful enough, the reader could simply uh, look at the translation uh, frame and check the full translation at any time. Key design issues included keeping the user aware of the system status. By sewing a marker under the current row, the user could easily see that the tracker was following correctly. The user could also adjust the row if it, the calibration was off. When automatic translation was given by sewing the clause, it was done with extra uh, discretion. 
the font and its color was chosen so that it did not jump to the eye. Also, it was shown after a brief delay, thus unnecessary glosses went often on unnoticed as the user continued reading. Interestingly, some participants also started to take benefit of the case interaction by intentionally staring at words as they wanted them to be translated, diminishing the line between implicit and explicit case control. The final design issue I want to highlight is user experience. Obviously, if the user is hard to use, uh, it will not be a success. But uh, what is usable for one may not be usable for somebody else. The ability to customize the settings is needed. From gaze-based assistive technology, we have learned that the requirement to focus on the virtual screen when entering text can be annoying as it prevents maintaining case contact uh, when communicating. Compare this to the manual method where the conversation partner is holding the communication board and interpreting uh, the case of the person. Perhaps in future, somebody solves this and brings to the market a gaze communication system that allows facing the person uh, when communicating by gaze. On the other hand, Dwelling on people might be considered rude. This may happen if dwelling is used to fetch information about that person, for example, to support memory. Who was that person? Oh, there is the name. Also, if abnormal eye movements are used in public, that may attract unwanted attention. People care about how uh, they look and how the technology makes them look. Experiences from Google classes told us that social acceptability and related issues such as privacy or safety indeed matter. According to Mele and Federici, so far the focus has been on technology design and users are often considered as a measurement object to prove that the technology works. If we are to design technology that acts as a facilitator to seamlessly augment human abilities. These user experience issues cannot be ignored. Before discussing uh, briefly some future views and proposing the call for research for human augmentation, I will recap some of the key lessons learned from previous research on case, uh, case interaction. First, one should match the task with suitable eye movement type and technology, taking into account the required accuracy and suitable interaction methods. Controllability and non-interfering design should be the guiding principles for human augmentation interfaces to avoid distraction and frustration caused by unwanted proactivity. The whole idea is that the user is able to focus on the tasks, but still feel being in control even if the system assists by augmenting sensing actions or cognition. Feedback and visibility of the system status are key to success and closely related to controllability. Without proper feedback, case interaction is prone to errors. Furthermore, if a person is voluntarily wearing personal gaze-based or gaze-aware augmentation uh, technology, I assume they know something about it, how it functions. Thus, I personally uh, don't consider hiding the system fun functionality and going all automatic is the best way to go. However, the level of feedback depends on the task. Explicit case input may require explicit feedback, while implicit use of case in the background of an attentive system may benefit from more subtle feedback. In any case, the user should be able to customize the features, for example, sensitivity of the system or level of augmentation. Uh, designing a system that meets the needs of the user and provides good ex user experience requires knowledge of the user, context and tasks. If we are to wear the augmentation technology in everyday life, acceptability, social norms, and user experience must be considered. 
This is especially important for novel technology that has not yet established itself as a normal part of our lives. And remember, if it doesn't work at worst, it, it doesn't mean there isn't a way to make it a success. There are many small things that can be adjusted to make it better. Keep on testing and iterating. For future applications, case still holds a lot of unleashed potential demonstrated by prototype systems and research conducted over the years. For example, I have seen case controlled games, but I controlled toys are still next to non-existent. Nokia presented their future vision for applied use of eye tracking in mixed reality for more than 10 years ago. Nowadays, many VR headsets come with eye tracking. Eye movement tracking can also be hidden in the frames of eyeglasses. I personally am excited about the opportunities of using information from eye movements to track our cognitive abilities. Today, when social media and various other technologies interrupt us all the time, being able to concentrate seems increasingly harder. Perhaps we need a Fitbit for the mind that uh, would support and encourage concentration, for example, by measuring how much time we focus on reading. Kai Kunze and his colleagues have done pioneering work on this. As you see, despite all the advancements, there is still a lot to be done. And human augmentation is one area that holds potential and deserves attention. Thus, I end this talk by promoting the call for research that has been announced in our recent article, Human Augmentation. Realizing the vision for augmented humans requires defining an overall interaction paradigm and metaphors that en enable to benefit from augmented sense, actions, and cognitive abilities. This would take us from interacting with the technology to augmented abilities. In other words, instead of using the technology as a tool, uh, augmented abilities would, would rather feel like part of our natural abilities. Work is also needed on the sensing and augmentation technologies, experimental and applied research, as well as building a basis for theory and model augmentations, not to forget ethics and societal research. Case plays a crucial role in many of the scenarios for hum human augmentation. A key to this is a low-cost, robust, portable and wearable case tracking equipment with software that supports the user's actions seamlessly Today in this talk, I gave some hints that I hope are useful when visioning and designing such applications. And finally, rather than promoting research on human augmentation just to give superpowers to everybody, I want to encourage thinking from a different angle, taking the focus from interaction with technology towards human augmentation. I believe this change in perspective may lead to new innovations. Here is a list of the main references used for this talk, including the whole game book on case interaction and some of our articles that summarize the work done on the area. Also, the work presented today has been, con been conducted over many years at the Tauke Research Unit. So I especially want to acknowledge some of my close colleagues from the Visual Interaction Group, as well as Tauke uh, Research Center and some collaborators in the Kogan Association and the eye tracking community. Okay, but now I thank you for your attention. And do you have any comments or questions?